5. BMW R90S, 7376, the motorcycle division of BMW was taking a hammering in the early 1970s. Its model range was expensive, slow and looked dated. While the R755 is still highly regarded by historians, it had a speedo set in the headlight nacelle while everyone else had long before moved to twin gauges standing proud of the bodywork. The 6 Series, you say it like this, Stroke 6, was a giant leap forward but exhausted the enthusiasm of the company. Five-speed gearboxes, better styling and bigger engines were offset by black paint, white if the bikes were for the police, and no energy to promote their new virtues. A young Hans Muth had just joined the company as a car interior designer but was a rider and found himself in short order making illicit visits to the motorcycle area. Allegedly, in a casual conversation with the boss of motorcycles, Hans Gunther von der Marwitz, he expressed disappointment that the 6 Series didn't have a sporting flagship. Marwitz allegedly told him to design one and he spent the following months working on it while his bosses thought he was designing drink holders for the rear seat passengers in a four-door sedan. The result was the R90S. It shared much with the state R96 but had enough subtle changes to allow it to stand on its own and wow the crowds. The styling centerpieces were a bikini fairing which had four instruments suggesting a plane cockpit. This was complemented by a tailpiece just the right distance from the cockpit to suggest aerodynamic modernity. The first R90S models had two-tone dark and silver paint but the most popular had a Daytona orange two-tone color scheme. The paint process was expensive but at that time BMW was still hand-assembling bikes and also doing its pinstriping by hand. The S was fast with Delordo pumper carbs and performance modifications to the head. It had racing success which helped promote a new interest in the company and its products. A total of 17,455 bikes were produced between September, 73 and June, 76 with the pick of them being from June, 74 onwards when alterations to the camshafts and main bearings were undertaken to allow for how hard the bikes were being ridden. Hans left BMW eventually and went to a company which ended up designing Suzuki's Katana but he'd certainly left his mark on a classic bike with enduring beauty. The ride it's still a treat in 2021 to throw a leg over an R90S. In terms of rider comfort and point-to-point -point times, it makes you wonder if bikes have advanced at all in the past 50 years. It's a big bike and suits riders over 6 foot. Its turn of speed is spread over its reverend range despite its sporting intent. As with all BMWs of that period, owners had to learn how to change gear silently with a technique which involved pausing between gears. Once you got on top of it, you were in a position to sneer at those who couldn't do it and thought the gearbox was clunky. It would do 200 km per hour and was, prior to speed cameras, able to cruise effortlessly at speeds not far below this. 4. Ducati 916, 94 98. Nobody reading I am will be surprised to see Ducati's 916 included in the 10 most beautiful bikes of all time. It was an absolute game changer when it was launched in 1994 and the influence of its design is still reverberating through the bike design world. It's another bike in this list which will still look beautiful in 2050 and this is reflected in its inclusion in the Guggenheim Museum's The Art of the Motorcycle exhibition in 1998-99. Kajiva owned Ducati at the time and design duties fell to the Centro Ricerche Kajiva, CRC, design house in San Marino which was under the influence of Massimo Tamburini. While it's only one of two bikes in this list that has a fairing, much of its design credentials are on public display, including its chrome moly trellis frame, its single-sided swingarm, its upside-down forks and its under-seat exhausts. Its design was an ingenious match of form and function. The single-sided swingarm makes it easier to change wheels and the under-seat exhaust improved the bike's aerodynamic performance. The bike won four Superbike World titles between 1994 and 98 mostly with Carl Fogarty on the seat but with Australia's Troy Corser winning in 1996. The heart of the 916 is the 90-degree V-twin now synonymous with Ducati and it's a beautiful engine in itself before considering its place on the complete bike. It's largely hidden by the fairing but the shape and position of the fairing play a major role in the proportions of the bike, emphasizing aggressive thrust and dragging the rest of the bike along. And it's small. There have been larger 250s in the market. Part of its visual appeal is how much detail you can fit into such a tiny package. It's easy to think the rider was an afterthought when the 916 was designed. You don't really notice how small and cramped the bike is until you climb aboard and attempt to locate your feet somewhere near the pegs. The bars are set very low so you don't have much option other than a racing crouch. The discomfort you feel with the riding position has one advantage in that it diverts attention from the plank-like, thinly padded seat. 
All these things would have been far from Troy Corser's mind while he was piloting the bike to the 1996 Superbike Championships and watching him ride suggest that, at 10 tenths, the ergonomics make sense. Around the city, though, almost any other bike would be preferable. 3. Yamaha SRV 250, 93 97 Occasionally, when you least expect it, a gem of a bike can slip past without it being recognized at the time. Such was the fate of the Yamaha SRV 250, Renesa. Yamaha had a monster success story on its hands, early 90s, with the frankly awful 15250, hey, I can buy this on my L's and everyone will think I ride a Harley. Since Yamaha already had this V-twin engine, it decided to use it in a proper road bike as well. Until 2014, Yamaha never had an internal design department for its bikes, instead outsourcing this function to GK Design and offshoot GK Dynamics. During an exhibition in 1987, when the first sketches of the SRV 250 were surely already on the drawing boards, GK Design's boss, Kenji Ekin, elaborated on an earlier claim that the motorcycle is sex. The highly eroticized language of the exhibition program said the motorcycle is the love toy of the human being called Adam, his, Eve Machina. The shape of the SRV 250 has a resulting femininity which is hard to ignore, sleek, slim, flowing and with curves from the elongated fuel tank that mate beautifully with the side covers and seat. Even though the engine was from the 15250, it had a useful extra six horses courtesy of two carburetors rather than one in a higher compression ratio. The first SRV 250s had dual instruments but the Renesa model which came down south had just a speedo mounted directly in front of the rider. The whole bike was clean, neat and uncluttered. It also had a new frame very reminiscent of the Norton featherbed frame, giving it hints of Cafe Racer. The skinny tires and wheels suited the design and it's easy to imagine if Vincent had ever made a 250, it would want it to have looked something like this. Depending on which market you were in, SRV 250s arrived quietly in 93 and left quietly in 97. They were variously available in silver and gold but the pick of the colors was a rich green which, as Ekin implied, had strong suggestions of the Garden of Eden. The SRV 250 is a long, slim bike which suits slightly taller riders. Its narrowness makes it ideal for city riding but its 140 to 150 km per hour indicated top speed also made it useful on the open road. It would eat the kilometers at a relaxed 120 km per hour. Working against that was a thin seat which became uncomfortable after about an hour in the saddle. The solution was multi-density foam rather than thicker padding as it would be sinful to ruin the seat's lines. The 9090th's 18 front tire and 110 90th's 18 rear were just right for quick steering but the wheelbase and rake trail specifications gave it great stability at higher speeds. 2. Manx Norton, 62. While the Manx Norton is a race bike, it meets our criteria of a production bike in that in the period between 1947 and 1962, it was widely available to anyone with the cash to order one. Norton itself stopped racing them in 1954 but kept building the bikes for privateers. Production finished at the Norton home in Bracebridge Street in 1963 but such was the dominance of the model that Godfrey Nash won the Yugoslavian GP on one in 1969. It's in IM's top 10 for its physical beauty rather than its racing success and it comes from a period where function influenced aesthetics, if it worked well, it was beautiful. The starting and finishing style statement is the engine. It has the profile of a bodybuilder's torso with a muscular bottom end and a slim waist which expands into a massive upper body. The abiding impression is one of brute strength, it's masculine like no other bike ever made. In 1950, the Irish McCandless brothers shaped a frame which perfectly complemented the Norton engine. It became known as the featherbed frame after a comment from a Norton TT rider who claimed it was like racing on a featherbed. The McCandless frame went on to influence designers around the world and you can see it reflected in the 6 Series BMWs, Yamaha's SRV 250 and even the Harris Performance frame being used for the current Royal Enfield Continental GT. Replicas of the original McCandless frame are still widely available, as are pattern parts for the 500 engine which is a testimony to how revered this bike became. In keeping with function influencing form for the better, the Manx Norton evolved through its life to keep it competitive and the last models with the single-seat rear hump are the best looking. The Manx Norton of 1962 had a beautiful big tank but very thin lines everywhere else. The minimalist presentation included an industrial colored but pretty front drum brake with a large air scoop for cooling. The AJS7R came close to matching the Manx Norton's looks but the Norton dominated its generation and its powerful physical presence remains today. 
you sit low in the seat of a late model Manx Norton and need to stretch across the large tank to access the clip on bars which are short, accentuating the narrowness of the bike but also expressing the designer's belief that the bike is stable enough at high speed not to require wider controls. The tuned length exhaust system stops not far past the right rear peg so the rider hears a lot of what the engine is doing. With a 4-speed gearbox and a top speed north of 200 km per hour, the lower gears are widely spaced. Power varies according to specifications but 47 horsepower was common and, given it's only driving 140 kg, the Manx feels fast wherever you are in the reverend range. It comes into its own properly as road speed rises and it's easy to understand if you weren't on one from 1947 onwards, the best you could ever hope for was second place. 1. Ducati 750 Sport, 72 73rds, there are riders so drugged by their devotion to Ducati that they think a list of the 10 most beautiful bike of all time should only consist of Ducatis. They have a point when you consider the 900 SS, the Halewood replica, the 450 single and the 916. Ducati made mistakes, though. The 860, the Paso, the 500 twins and, arguably, some of the derivatives of the 916. Unarguably, its 750 Sport, known also as the 750S, of 1972 to 1974 will always remain as one of the best-looking bikes of any generation. Fabio Taglioni's 90-degree L-twin design is beautiful in itself. It exudes air and space as well as purpose, particularly when compared with V-twins in the 45-60 to 60 degree range. You need to remember this was Ducati's first L-twin and the company made much use of outside suppliers for the rest of the bike. This makes the final integration and proportions of the finished product all the more amazing. The frame was an adaptation of a Colin Seeley design to which was bolted contributions from Barani, Conti, Lockheed, Marzocchi, Dell, Orto and many others. It could have ended up looking like a dog's breakfast. Instead, using the handsome 750 GT which had been finished two years earlier as a base, the 750 Sport developed a character all its own. Where does the beauty come from? It starts with the long wheelbase, 1,500 mm, and stretched front end. Then there's the slim, sensuous tank which runs into the solo seat with its perfectly proportioned, rounded tail. Features which clutter other bikes are ignored, the 750 Sport doesn't have a starter motor or indicators. The round cases of the Sport engine have a sensuality all of their own although you don't really notice it until you compare them to the brutalism of the later square case engines. Lastly, and simply, there's the yellow paint with some subtle highlights of black. Be still my beating heart. The 750 Sport has old-school straight-line stability at some small expense to chuckability. Its long, slim lines mean you need to stretch for the bars but you need to kick-start the engine first as it doesn't have an electric leg. The gearbox is one up, four down and the clutch is surprisingly light. The engine's strong point is its mid-range torque. Claimed power is 62 horsepower at 8,200 revolutions per minute that there's no need to go anywhere near those revs to enjoy what the L-Twin has to offer. Brake specifications changed in the short model life of the 750 Sport but neither of the two options were exceptional. Despite the rider's knees and elbows being closer together than normal, anyone riding a 750 Sport always looks elegant.